My name is Nancy McGee, and I am the retired director of STEM. There is life after, uh, after education. I spent uh, 34 years in public education with an emphasis on really having great hands-on, highly engaging learning. I since moved on to work for the National Aviation Education Center to get their programming up and running and created. And I now work with school districts and with nonprofits as a consultant to create really good, engaging, vertically aligned STEM programming. We, we have a dearth of experiential learning, and, and that's the other side of my life is I make underwater documentaries. I travel to places nobody else has ever been, and I connect that with schools and students because that it's that experiential learning that's huge. Good morning, I'm Dustin Miller, Vice President of Learning and Guest Experience at the Dallas Arboretum. Uh, we see 100,000 school students a year, both in on-site and off-site programming largely focused on earth and life science. Um, and for me, STEM is collaborative experiences that move life forward. Good morning, my name is Sherika Sanders. I am Senior Technical Engineer for Manor Polymers in McKinney, Texas. I've been in manufacturing for about 25 years now. Um, and what STEM means to me is using my God-given gifts and talents to make the world a better place. Hello, I'm Mary Urquhart. I'm head of the Department of Science and Mathematics Education and director of the UTeach Dallas Secondary STEM Teacher Preparation Program at the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, by training, I'm a planetary scientist with a background in astrophysics and geophysics, and I've spent the tw past 25 years or so in STEM education. Um, so what STEM means to me, it's a way of engaging with the world, uh, to me, STEM is for everyone. It's skills, but it's more than skills. It's the ability to be a lifelong learner. It's the ability to constantly engage with the world with that STEM focus and to be able to enhance your skills because they will change. Hi, I'm Kate Althier. I'm a principal, so I feel slightly underqualified over here with all my um, But I'm a principal. I uh, lead a Wildman Steam Academy in Waxhachie ISD. I opened the school six years ago. I've been in administration for 10 years. Um, and um, what, STEAM, what STEM means to me, and I say STEAM because we're a STEAM campus. Um, so for me, it's more than an acronym. We teach our students that it's about how we, and our teachers, how we attack problems, how we solve problems, how we look at the world around us, um, and preparing our students for the future. Good morning, I'm Ernest Huffman. I'm a program manager with North Central Texas Council of Governments and I manage our aviation planning and education program area. Primarily, we do the aviation system planning for the region. I'm responsible for integrating all drone technology and advanced air mobility technologies in the Metroplex. And for STEM, I think STEM is the most assured way of getting yourself out of poverty in America today. And that's, that's what STEM is for me. Sorry, y'all know who I am, so I'm just going to jump to what um, I think STEM is. I think we have to look at the question. So when we look at what is STEM, STEM to me are those occupations that are tied to those SOC codes, the STEM SOC codes and those STEM fields. When we look at STEM education, that is different. STEM education is not an acronym. It's not the silos. It's taking your content and applying that content, whether it's science, math, social studies or reading to solve a problem using uh, technology as a tool. And so when you have those components, you have STEM education and, and those STEM opportunities and experiences. Excellent. So I'm just going to ask our panel questions. And, and panelists, I'm going to let you just jump in where you feel comfortable so not everybody has to answer this. Let's start with our first question is, how can we increase the student interest and engagement, especially in our underrepresented groups, in STEM subjects. I'm happy to take that. Can I have the mic? So it gets back to that idea that STEM is for everyone. I think there are perceptions out there that STEM is for a very limited group of people, that it's for people who have um, a special born you know, innate aptitude in mathematics or in computer science or in science when in fact we're engaging with STEM every day. Everyone is engaging with STEM every day. 
And if we can make it relevant to students and their lives, whether it's in the classroom in our formal context or whether it's an informal context, I think that is where we can really reach students. And if we can help reflect STEM so that they can see that people who look like them, people who are from the environments they're from, are also successful in STEM, that will make a huge difference. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, that's a pretty loaded question, um, but I'll, I'll just keep it brief in that. Um, some of the ways that we can engage students, especially um, those in underrepresented my, uh, minority groups, um, are for people like myself and other people who, like you say, look like them, make themselves available. Um, so if they can see it, they can be it. Um, that's one of the things that, that I enforce. I have two boys. Um, of my own and some of the other things that we do to help them engage in STEM fields is to um, encourage them to know that they can be successful in the STEM field. So we say affirmations at night. I am smart. I am good in math. I will be successful. So different things like that that we can do at home as, as parents to engage this uh, subset of students um, is really important. Dustin, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just one addition. Um, my, my background in this former school, formal school space is elementary. Um, two case studies that, that for me were very impactful in my practice. Uh, Seattle Public Schools completely flipped their third grade science curriculum so that each school could see how they're connected to the Puget Sound. Um, so it gave every individual campus a very real connection to conservation and to, to real life scenarios that impacted specifically where they lived. The other one is Baltimore Public Schools uh, partnered with quite a few informal institutions. So they were doing design challenges with Under Armour, uh, partnering with the National Aquarium. So they found those, those real life connections with informal partners in the community that gave students something to tie onto. Anybody else? Dustin, I love that you added that, that real connection because I think that students will always produce more if what they're doing is for the real world instead of for the teacher in the front of the room. So that is a huge opportunity that we have and, and so many different corporate groups, nonprofits are, are jumping up to help out because they want that authentic learning opportunity for their students and they want that diversity of thought involved in their projects, so that's excellent. So my next question is, what are some innovative approaches or methods that can make STEM education more accessible and inclusive for students with diverse backgrounds and abilities? This kind of goes with the other question, I think, too. So on our campus, and, and again, what we believe, um, when, I, when I was hired for my position in my interview, my superintendent said, well, how are you going to reach students, or how is this going to work? How is STEM going to work for students who you know, um, have differing abilities, or they're from different backgrounds? And I said, well, it's for everybody. So just exactly like what you said. So at our school, we have a very diverse population from all different backgrounds. We have um, a very high autistic population on our campus um, from K-5. So uh, we have ID students. We have students from all different backgrounds and they all do well um, in, in our program. And um, our, our content areas are not silos, so we integrate content areas, um, we bring in real world, real world connections. One way that you can make it innovative, engaging, is using community partners. We partner with Jacobs Engineering in Dallas, which is one of the largest engineering firms in the world. Our students go there every year and get to interact for a full day with engineers. Um, they come to our campus, and things on our campus as well. There's so many partners out there that want to be a part of our schools. We just have to ask, and we have to dream big, and then we have to go and find those people. Um, my prior um, job was sales before I came into education. I'm alternatively certified, so yay. Um, <laughs> I, I always thought that many of us. And, um, and so that has a lot to do with me not being afraid to ask. Um, but I feel like it is for everyone, and we make it engaging and exciting, and that's from getting your teachers excited, too. So you train your teachers up, you let them have a growth mindset, you let them work through things and try things with the kids and fail and teach the kids that that's okay. So I think that kind of all goes, it's a culture. It's the culture of your campus um, from a campus side. I'm not an educator and I don't work in the classroom environment, but from my perspective, and this is what I tell industry, in particular on the aviation side, it's uh, always being present. So I think schools need to provide opportunities for industry to be on campus, present as much as possible for as many things as possible. I go back to thinking about the things I remember from school and my education and those programs that I remember, and it was those 
programs that were almost always there, like the, the officer friendly programs, DARE and things like that, that were always there, ever present. And those are the things that stick. So I think if you want to uh, push STEM careers, you want STEM industry there all the time, those brands there all the time, those folks involved in these kids' life, after school, things of that nature, uh, that's what makes things successful. And I'd just like to add to that. I think that talking about STEM careers and preparing students for STEM careers is incredibly important, but I don't think it's the only thing that we need to do. I think we need to have really STEM for all. The curiosity for every student, an ability for every student to see how STEM matters in their lives. And I think that means making connections. Not just projects that are going to show how it can be applicable in industry or applicable to a community where the teacher selects the projects, but also student-driven projects. Really projects that inspire the students to want to learn more about the disciplines and see how those skills integrate into their own excitement and interest. Um, so I'll just take this opportunity to, to give a plug to McKinney ISD. So we have a um, particular program that is all encompassing of everything that everyone has just said here. Um, and so through industry partners, um, we have um, given our students an opportunity to uh, join a STEM club. And it's not just the traditional STEM club. Um, so, um, in terms of giving you guys ideas of different things that you can do, it's all encompassing in that we go to the school and we have a big STEM day. We touch every sixth grader in, that, in the middle schools and um, allow them to see the different parts of STEM that they can be involved in. And then what we're doing at that time is we're also targeting students who may not have otherwise had the opportunity to join the STEM club. So they um, may show a different spark. You know that spark you see in the students that that light bulb goes off where, you know, I think I might be able to do this, but I don't know if I will have the support of my parents or I don't know if I will have the support of my teachers. Those are the students that we target. And then after that, they do things like they will come to work with me for a full day and they will run our manufacturing plant from top to bottom. Um, they do quality, they do manufacturing, they do R&D, they make sales calls, then they call the customer back and make the pitch after they decide how much they want to sell the product for, and they spend the entire day doing that. Um, and so those are some different ideas where you can partner with different industry partners and do similar activities like that. You know, the partners are there, those community partners, they're, they're very anxious and desirous of working with students, but they're scared. You know, how, how do I get into the classroom? What do I do? What does this look like? So it's up to you, the educator, to help get them to come to the table, and then they'll be amazed with what students can do. And I love that, that the community partnership here was something that was really emphasized because students will rise to those challenges, and we've seen students do some really remarkable work at a very adult level, and in some cases solve problems that the adults in the room couldn't solve because they look at it from a different approach. I also love, Katie, that you talked about the importance of having a STEM culture, so that that's a piece of it. But what I want to challenge you guys today about is, why does all the cool STEM stuff happen after school? Why isn't it happening during the day? So keeping that in mind, my next question. What are other key challenges in STEM education today, and how can they be addressed? I think one of the STEM challenges is in preparing and supporting our teachers. And I know that's a space that I work in, but I can tell you that it's a challenge to recruit people into the profession and to really see how wonderful the profession is. And I, I love the you teach model for taking STEM majors, giving them that opportunity, as well as career changers who may be interested in STEM, um, or in STEM teaching, I should say. But I also think it's really important to support the teachers that we have. I'm really excited that this ecosystem exists to continue that work. Um, and I think we need a lot more of that. So this is one area that we looked at a lot when we did our STEM listening tour, 
is we asked districts, what are the barriers for doing STEM? And of course, this is pre-standards. Um, we didn't have any idea we would have TEKS um, that kind of pulled the lever of, of getting the program started. But the top three things that came out were really just STEM myths. Uh, the first one was time. We just don't have time to do this. It can't be one more thing, which we completely agree. It can't be one more thing. It's your approach to teaching. Um, it's what you're already doing and embedding those opportunities in with your lessons. So we currently do the 5E model in um, science. So we have that inquiry process. We do the engage, we do the explore, we do the explain, all that stays the same. What we're seeing that a lot of success with is taking that elaborate st uh, stage of the learning cycle. And when we're pushing and making those connections to the real world, those connections are through engineering design challenges. So you're not doing additional things, you're restructuring that time that's already allotted for teaching science in that 5E model. Um, so that, that's a time issue. Another thing that we hear is money, like we can't afford a 3D printer or a robot or a drone. And that's not a requirement of STEM education. STEM education can be done with cotton balls and cardboard. It doesn't have to be high tech and, and high cost materials. That's a myth. And so don't let that be a barrier. Um, the third barrier that we saw in Texas was um, perception of ability. And this goes back to what Mary was talking about. There's a perception only the high performing students are capable of doing STEM um, and that our gifted and talented students um, should be the only ones doing STEM. And what I've, I've talked to districts about is if we're only training this many of our kids to do STEM, who is going to fill all of these jobs that we have? We have to train everybody and expose everyone. And they may not want to go into STEM, uh, but they will, have, they will all become problem solvers and they will all have those critical skills to do whatever they want to do. Um, but we, it has to be for all. We cannot continue in Texas to move forward with only the gifted and talented or the students that opt in um, through a test to be um, trained in STEM education. Thanks, Michelle. How can educational institutions collaborate and bridge the gaps of the workforce with our industry partners to provide real world exposure and experiences in STEM? Matt, I think you've addressed this too, is give students practical hands-on experience um, in spaces like informal science institutions like the Arboretum. It's through internships, which have to be paid. Um, that gets back to making sure that we have a diverse workforce. If we're only offering for internships, we are not going to get as diverse of an offering of students coming to, to be in these internships. Um, so that's my side soapbox there. Uh, but really it is providing opportunities. We, at the Arboretum, we have a huge education mission, but we also have professional horticulturalists um, who, who can provide valuable mentorship. So looking at your community partners who are working in spheres that you may not necessarily uh, think about when you're, when you're talking STEM, um, we've got jobs, we've got people who can mentor, and, and we have funds that can pay for interns. Um, yeah, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, but what I would say from the experience um, of engaging the educational system from a industry partner perspective, y'all got to make it easier for us to engage. Um, and so what I mean by that is um, there are other school districts that um, my company in particular have tried to engage with, but there are all, there's a lot of red tape. Um, and there's a lot of difficulty in, in trying to engage. Now, once you're in there, you're good. Um, but just opening up the invitation, I would say that a lot of times the industry doesn't feel like the educational system um, is wanted. Um, so I worked for the Dow Chemical Company prior to coming to McKinney for, to, to McKinney, um, for over 10 years. 
And the Dow Chem Chemical Company is a, a, the largest chemical company in the world. Um, and for them to engage as a large conglomerate was very difficult. Um, and so, you know, just being able to, to, to offer help um, and having the educational system have a, a, a open arms would be better as well. Um, I'd just like to, to add to that some of the challenges of working with formal education versus informal. There was a, a question earlier, Nancy, about why do we see so much in informal spaces? And I'd say because it's easier to engage. Mm -hmm. And that's no fault of the formal education system. I, when I was doing NASA Education and Public Outreach and we wanted to talk about our s space mission in public schools, we had to sit down and see what is required in the schools. What are teachers required to teach? What are students required to learn? And then map what we could bring on top of that. And that was the way that we could make it into classrooms. And I think that conversation is a longer one. It's a more challenging one. But it's essential if we're going to reach every student. Because not every student in Region 10 will be able to have the privilege of going to the Arboretum or being able to be in a STEM club. We have to bring it to our classrooms, but that's going to require, again, these deep conversations and commitments from partners to really bring what they need and what they have to the table. So what we do with Jacobs on our campus is um, we have our, our teachers collaborate and they look at what's coming up in science, because that's how we plan at our schools. We start with science, so we use STEM scope science, we start with science, and then we integrate our content areas with that. Um, but we look at what's coming up in science and then we talk to the engineers. We have one particular contact. He graduated from our STEM high school in our district, um, and he actually graduated from like where our campus is now. That's where his was, so it's just kind of a very nostalgic thing for him. And so we look at what's coming up, and then they come up with projects with their engineers that we can do with our that they can do with our students. And so um, like they even came and worked with our kindergarten students. So they'll come in. Um, the teachers are a part of it too. They take up our cafeteria. Um, and they work on these projects with them. And so it's a really good experience for them because they get to see the educational world and what we're learning um, in our system and then bridging that with, with what they're doing in the real world, so. I'll start for starters. I'd say, I'd say here in Texas, you guys do a, a greater job than I've seen elsewhere in the country on integrating industry with the students. I've lived in, I'm from Syracuse, New York. I've lived in Chicago. I'm from, I lived in the DC area. I've lived in Florida. I've lived in New York City. And you guys are killing it down here in Texas. And I'm always talking about how great a job they're doing in Texas schools, in particular with STEM. The fact that we were having this forum mm. says a lot. But I think industry-led collaborative efforts with school districts go along, goes a long way as well. I know uh, Tarrant, uh, was it Tarrant School District? Tarrant. They collaborated with 11 other ISDs to form the North Texas Aerial Robotics Initiative, and that's a funded effort that they got TEA funds to do, and that was funded with, or oh, collaborated with industry and school districts. And I think more of that industry-led uh, collaborative efforts with school districts that are funded, when you have funding that goes a long way, um, that will help us with what we're trying to do. And I'll just add one, one more thing. Everything here is, that's been brought up is super. Um, you guys are in the golden bubble. Everybody wants to get into the golden bubble, into the schools. And so all the folks that reach out to me, industry, nonprofit, higher ed, they're all asking me, how do we actually get into the schools? They all want to get into the schools. Many of them have free resources. Um, they have things that they want to share with you. And STEM has been going on in the nonprofit and IHE space for decades. I mean, STEM really in Texas has been a grassroots effort. So there's a lot of stuff out there. The good news for you guys is you have some leverage now with our new standards. There is a TEAK that says to collaborate and use resources from the out of school providers. And so that gives you an opportunity if your principal has been hesitating to bring in some folks whether they're in industry or, or someone else, you can pull that standard out in every grade and you can say, well, this is part of the TEAK is to build STEM awareness and to use resources from out of school uh, programs. And that, that standard is the bridge that we're trying to build between um, in our ecosystem to our former formal educators. And so that, that helps. Um, so if you need that talking point, because sometimes it's not your decision 
it's higher than you, that is a talking point for helping get folks into your classroom. Thank you. That is all great information to know that there's so much available. And really, when you think in Region 10 of what we have between the Dallas Arboretum, we've got so many informal education opportunities that are all a reasonable distance from our schools. But, you know, the reality is buses and lunches can make or break a program. And I have sat down with so many different uh, industry partners, informal educators to explain this is this is the system, this is what we have to work within, so help us think through that. Mm -hmm. But really it also takes that one person in the building who is willing to go through that red tape, who will remove the barriers to make those opportunities happen for our students. And I know that there's some serious burnout from individuals who have fought those battles. But what I want to tell you is from seeing those students, and you know you have, and everybody on this panel has seen the look on that kid's face, the aha moments when they recognize that they're capable of doing something, there's a world out there that they want to connect with, it's worth those battles. So keep fighting the good fight and make that happen for our students. So next question, what resources or support networks are available for students interested in pursuing STEM careers outside of traditional educational settings? So I, I have to put back on um, my education public reach, outreach hat again and say there are a ton of resources available. They're available from federal agencies such as NASA, such as NOAA, such as the United States Geologic Survey, just many, many resources. They're available from universities. My university, we have lots of free resources that we would love to share with you, um, as well as professional development opportunities. Um, they're available many places, and many of them are available for students, so it's not just for teachers. So places you can send students where they can get fabulous information, they can get frequently updated information. Um, like, for example, we have upcoming eclipses happening. Go to NASA. Mm -hmm. Go to the NASA Solar System website. Go to um, our eyes on, or excuse me, our exoplanets website. There are just many exciting things that students can get just by looking. I mentioned the STEM toolkit earlier. If you've not been to the STEM webpage um, on TEA, which is super easy to navigate, um, but not really, that's a joke. Um, so in the, the search bar at the top, just type in STEM and it'll take you to the, the webpage. But in the STEM toolkit, there is a tool under the community tools called um, the STEM Continuum. And it's a pre-K, through college continuum that gives you ideas of in and school, out of school, family activities. Um, so there's a lot of resources in there and it names just a, a ton of different out of school options. Everything on that list is free, everything. So that is a source you can look at to find some ideas as well. Um, so, just to name a few, I mean, there are a few that people sort of overlook because they are kind of old school, but um, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts have a lot of STEM resources. Um, the Boys and Girls Club have a lot of STEM resources. Um, and then the others are um, um, NSBE, so National Society of Black Engineers, um, have a lot of resources. Nova Shade, which is along the lines of those as well. Um, and then there's Girl Start. Girl Start um, has a big STEM extravaganza. Um, they have STEM workshops um, and different things like that. So there are quite a few out there. Um, if you just Google the activity that you want, so if you Google a math activity or coding or things like that, the different ones will pop up. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add also, just in, in um, picking up on your comment, the number of professional societies so if you have professional societies, those are great places to look for resources, whether it's chemists or engineers, mathematicians, um, computer scientists, lots of great K-12 resources available. 
Oh, one more. I will be out of my mind um, if I didn't say this one because I sit on the board. But <laughs> it's the Society of Plastics Engineers, um, SPE. We have a lot of resources on their website as well. And two informal spaces. Uh, the Informal Science Education Association of Texas is the largest professional network of folks working in informal learning spaces. Uh, so they can connect you. If they don't, if there's not someone who is in the group, they know someone who is connected to what you're looking for. And then Texas Children and Nature Network is also another back, backbone organization that just brings together resources. Um, and all the research shows kids are happier, healthier, and smarter if they're outdoors. Uh, so they have a lot of the research around that as well. Always made, need my vitamin N. <laughs> <laughs> so please feel free to reach out to any one of us because we all have a lot of recommendations for partners for you to get into your classrooms or out into the field. My last question here, what emerging trends or developments in STEM education do you find particularly exciting or promising? And I'm going to add to that, just throwing it out there because I'm sure it's the elephant in the room, is AI. Now nobody <laughs> wants to answer that, right? I'll start us off. Uh, I actually wrote that down in my book. You can uh, <laughs> say, uh, so this is not from TEA. This is my personal um, interest. I, I do think that it, um, AI is an interesting topic, topic in education, and I've seen um, in uh, the educational space in different regions how they're responding. Some regions have fully embraced AI. They're doing lesson planning with AI. They're doing grading. They're doing research. They're teaching students how to use it as a tool. There are some AI sandboxes that are out there that are for students to get in and learn how to use AI as a tool. Um, so I think it's a very interesting space. This is one of the new um, kind of breaking things. The AI is not new, but having it in the hands of anybody is pretty new. Um, and it is something that is just breaking out across the entire nation. So I think it's going to be very interesting to watch it unfold in the next five years. Um, some people are terrified of it and some people are super excited about it. So it's going to be interesting to see what, what happens in education um, in Texas over the next five years with AI. I, I got a lot to say about AI, but I also speak <laughs> to my topic of, of interest, which is aviation. Mm -hmm. And I know this Region 10 uh, and on the chart, there wasn't a lot of aerospace and aviation stuff, but when you move west of the Metroplex, then that's when you get into all the aerospace manufacturing, aviation manufacturing. So anything you guys are teaching the kids to that end is going to go a long way, in particular in our region, because that's where all the jobs are. And when you talk about retirement age, that our industry in aviation, everybody's retiring, and I think we're close to 70% of folks going to be retiring out within the next five to 10 years. So anything on aviation, I push it, I push it heavy because we're doing that big time in the region. In terms of excitement, an emerging technology coming in aviation are electric takeoff and landing vehicles or, or advanced air mobility, which is autonomous aircraft. Think of the Jetsons. All of that stuff is coming to the Metroplex as well. And I'll tell you, we're going to have those type of operations by 2026 in, in, the North, in North Texas. So anything on that end, and if you need me to come talk to your class, I'll do it but it's, that's the exciting time for us in our region. I'll just add that we are on, in really at the dawn of a data revolution. We're in a data revolution for science. We have major telescopes that are going online on the ground, as well as you're all familiar with James Webb. We have data in just about every scientific field I can think of that is becoming more accessible to the general public, more accessible to students, and with tools that are going to allow people to have a much lower entry point. So we think about citizen science, this is notching that up where we may have students in K-12 schools who are making real contributions to science based on the data that's going to come available. Um, so for me, the emerging technology um, is recycling. So recycling, reuse, protection of our ozone layer, um, this idea of a circular economy, 
um, and how the things that we produce in manufacturing across the board, whether it be automobile manufacturing, aviation manufacturing, plastics and polymer science manufacturing, how can we reuse these things and implement some type of carbon sequestration so that we don't continue to destroy our ozone layer so that our children do have a future to look forward to. Um, so if you guys, just uh, along with my other panelists here, um, if you need someone to come and talk about, you know, how to recycle, what those different numbers mean, can you mix the recycle streams, and what happens if you do, um, we can take care of that for you as well. And not new, but for me, the most effective approach to, to engaging students in all of these topics is human-centered design. Uh, so really using that as your focus and the way you're learning um, for me is tops right now. Wow, that is a broad field to cover. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot out there for us. That's the nice, nice focus is so much available to impact our students positively. So I'd like to open this up to the audience for any questions that you may have of our panelists. And while you're thinking of your question, I'm going to start with my first one since I'm the one with the microphone. <laughs> so one of the struggles that I have seen as an educator is how do you prepare the teacher in the room for a new style of learning where the outcome is unknown to both the student and the teacher? Mm -hmm. That's my life. <laughs> That's my life. Um, so just. You have to model that, and again, it goes back to the culture of your campus. You have to have a safe culture. When we started, and we pulled teachers from across our district um, that have done you know, very traditional styles of teaching, some that had dabbled in STEM education, um, or what their thought of STEM education was. We had people from outside the district, so we had to bring them all together, together and get, under, get one idea of what we thought we wanted, our, we wanted our campus to look like and how STEM would look like in our campus. Um, and then I gave them the freedom to thrive in that too. Also providing professional development is huge. Um, and I'll talk about that in my presentation, but we used the National Institute for STEM Education and that was a game changer for us. And our teachers are still being trained in that now um, because I actually call it the National Institute of Best Teaching Practices um, because that's really what it is. And um, so that really brought our staff together. Um, but it's, it's, it's letting them try a lesson, try to incorporate the content areas, and then it just like flops and that's okay, and bringing our kids along in that process too. Um, so you have to have that, that autonomy with your teachers. It can't be scripted, it can't be, you have to do it this way. The way that you do it in your classroom may look a little bit different in another classroom, but giving everybody the same opportunity, all of our students, so. And no GT cluster classes are doing something like, those kids don't get something that everybody else doesn't get. That's a big view on my campus mm -hmm. too. Um, of course, we know we have to do some things differently uh, for them, but all of our kids deserve the same high quality instruction. So I'll just do a plug. I agree professional development is the most important thing that we need to do to support um, our, our teachers as they're trying to shift. This is a very different way of teaching and it is an instructional shift. It is a requirement in our, our science standards, the shift to happen. Uh, we have a statewide STEM training. Raise your hand if you've been to either the teacher or leadership. Raise it high, yeah, be proud. Uh, so if you've not attended, um, the statewide training, it takes you through design challenges and lets you be the student and experience the productive struggle in a, a design challenge um, so that you know how to facilitate that. And Sam, um, she does that training for both administrators and for um, teachers, so sign up for that. Um, and that, that's your first step. And then you, know, you will find whatever it is that are the needs of your campus, you'll customize that training to your campus. Um, but when you are selecting instructional materials, hey, throw that into the deal. They wanna make a sell. So tell them, I, I will buy your product if you throw in the professional development to support our teachers. Um, and so don't forget, you, you have some power there in getting training for your teachers as well. Some of it is, for the new teachers, some of it is on our backs at the university in the teacher preparation programs. I know that we have a project-based instruction course that's part of the UTeach model. But I, I don't think that in itself is enough. We really need to have a general comfort with discomfort 
Um, mm. PBL is one way of doing it. There are other approaches. I know some school districts are doing argument-driven inquiry. Um, there's engineering design challenges are awesome, but all of them have that piece. And we want comfort with discomfort with our students. It's really important for us as educators, regardless of our level, to embrace that for ourselves. Thank you. I can't emphasize that enough, and I've done a number of talks about life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. We never grow if we remain comfortable. So uncomfortable is a really good thing, and pushing students to be uncomfortable is a growth opportunity for them. So audience, do we have any questions from you? Just go ahead and jump up and shout it out. <laughs> I'm Kim Kirkland and I'm in You Teach Dallas and part of my job is I work with new teachers. I'm part of the induction program. What are we doing with new teachers, even our experienced teachers, to keep them relevant and to keep things, um, creating networks where they can grow and develop? We've had so many teachers say that they're getting a lot of classroom management training, but that they're not getting a lot on, on areas where they can progress and get stronger in their different All right, so quick summary would be, what are we doing to get teachers, to keep teachers relevant in their fields? Not just in teaching pedagogy, but in what's going on in the real world. I was just gonna say one thing that we do on our campus to do for my teachers is if they find, and this isn't just for teachers, it's also for our peers and our support staff, um, but if they find something out there that they want to learn and that they want to do, we'll figure out the resources through a donation, through a company sponsoring, through PTO, whatever it may be. Um, I encourage my teachers. Um, usually if I go to a conference, it's unusual not to have somebody with me today um, from my campus, but it didn't work out. Um, but I, uh, if, you know, if they're wanting to go to, um, I'm trying to think of it, like go to TCEA, then I encourage them also to apply to present there as well. So it builds their leadership skills, but they're also still getting um, learning. And so just trying to make that accessible to them and find the resources for them. I think this is a great question because I also used to work at an ESC. Um, I was in the panhandle and I heard this from my districts a lot. They wanted to deep dive into content without going back to college um, and without that big price tag. So one thing that I did was I used my ecosystem, and I know there are IHE people here, our colleges and universities. Um, I partnered with them and brought people like Mary in, and I had deep dives, deep content training in different areas. Um, I know Sam would be interested in partnering um, with the higher ed folks here. Um, and so whatever area we focused on, maybe it was earth science, we weren't covering earth science teaks for third grade or fourth grade, it was a deep dive into earth science and we brought in professors and they taught our teachers the content of earth science at a college level um, and it was refreshing. Uh, and not only, you know, our instruction in our classrooms improved because our teachers felt confident in their content, um, but it, we're learners. We're all in this business because we love to learn. And um, sometimes it's nice to just stretch your brain and um, nerd out with your people. Um, and so that's what we allowed that space for. And that is part of this ecosystem. So if that is a role that you have, either as a nonprofit or um, as a higher ed folk here today, reach out to Sam and say, hey, I would love to do a deep dive in GIS mapping or whatever it is that's your specialty, um, communicate that and um, that way that can be offered to teachers. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that I roped her into all this stuff, now I have the mic again. Um, so I wanted to speak to what Michelle was saying um, as both being a former and ESC person. I actually provide experience for teachers through our STEM cohort. Um, many of your teachers have been dabbling and dipping their toe in coming into different sessions that we do. That cohort has been a life source for STEM teachers for the past year. I'm doing it again this year, so my personal plug, if you want your teachers having more of those experiences, please have them join the STEM cohort. We're still 
uh, accepting people in. They come to sessions like they normally would. But those sessions are usually driven by ecosystem members. For example, TalkSTEM is here today. Uh, Dr. Koshi Dingra, she takes us through looking through the lens of STEM while you're out in the real world. So I have some experiences planned. My one on Monday is full, but you're welcome to look at my schedule and send your teachers. So we do provide those opportunities, but I would also like to partner with a higher ed for sure and get more of those deep dives going. So thank you for letting me steal. So I, I will absolutely say yay, higher ed. But at the same time, um, I think there's a lot of expertise in the school district as well. When working with the beginning teachers, um, one of the things that I have loved from experiences such as our um, Texas Regional Collaboratives are opportunities to bring experienced teachers and new teachers together. And it's not just for learning pedagogy. It's not just for learning classroom management. It's also about learning content as well. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of expertise in our schools. I'd love to see us work more collaboratively by honoring the expertise we have as well as reaching out to others. I love that, honoring the expertise we have because we've got so many educators that have a life outside the, the real, you know, our, outside the classroom, they don't roll us up in the map at the end of the day. So there's an opportunity to collaborate there. As a district level uh, administrator, I made sure that I funded opportunities for teachers to go have experience. So science teachers went to Caddo Lake and did water sampling. I took district level administrators to the landfill for an opportunity to see what it looks like. And from that grew a, a giant district wide collaborative that had art recycling projects and a huge gala event and we had STEM camp go to the landfill in the summertime, you know, just a lot of neat opportunities and it's all right there in your community. You just have to look at it a little differently. Again, we've got so many opportunities around the Metroplex. Amazon Fulfillment Center is a fascinating tour. Allow your teachers the opportunity to go experience the real world. It, there may not be a direct immediate connection, but we have smart educators who are going to find a way to bring that back into the classroom and do something really creative with that. So let them go experience the real world. I can't emphasize that enough. How are we doing on time there, Sam? We can take another question if you like. One more question from the field. One more. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Koshi Dingra. Sam just spoke about me. My question is, um, and I think a couple of you alluded to this earlier. Um, the best of intentions, this term STEM was coined about 20 years ago um, to break down the silos, as Michelle referred to. Um, and yet there's still, it's kind of almost become pigeonholed as a new stereotype in popular culture. And I was interested in how you see the kids you work with, if you work with kids or teachers or any other educators that you work with, how are they seeing STEM? Because I think that there's a lot of issues that I feel I hear about and I see, it's really just about the messaging around what is STEM, who does STEM, and popular culture often doesn't help because again, there's a lot of stereotyping. You may think about movies and so on and so forth. But I think all of those messages, both mega and micro levels, kind of impact all the work that we're trying to do. And I'm just curious as to what, what you see in this realm of messaging about STEM just from students and others that you speak to, you know, laypersons and any thoughts on that? So what is the messaging that you hear from students about STEM? <coughs> Our students see it for everyone. I think they see themselves in all of it because we expose them to that. Um, and then, you know, there's just like the stereotype that, you know, they, everybody has a lab coat, like that's not true. And so breaking that down for our kids often when they come in, um, like our kindergarten students, when we start talking about different careers, they even already have that from shows they've watched on TV or just from messaging that they've had out in the community. Um, so breaking that down and helping them understand that that's not true. Um, and uh, so I think that it's all about how we expose them to it in our classrooms and then how we bring that in um, from outside too. One of the things that I hear is STEM almost being used as a wedge to separate people. And I think that that's a problem. I think it's a problem in education. I know there are teachers who teach disciplines outside of STEM who get very upset 
by feeling like they're outside of that wedge. I think that happens at the universities as well, and I think it happens in society. So the idea of STEM being integrated into everybody's lives, and that it touches on every discipline, but that those disciplines are in service of STEM, I think is really important. Um, as far as messaging, it's kind of hard to say because um, we like to think that you know everybody is getting the same messaging, but every time I walk into a room and I say I have a PhD in chemistry, is really you? You know, whether it be from a female perspective or whether it be from a African American perspective. Um, and then when we look at our numbers for the state of Texas, our African American boys always fall to the bottom of every single category. So it makes you wonder, you know, what this messaging is and who is this messaging towards? Um, and who's receiving it and how they are receiving it. Um, and so I think I mentioned in the beginning that um, well, one, so I, I have a PhD in chemistry, I work in manufacturing, um, but I serve in the role as an engineer. So I'm not quite sure what my SOC code <laughs> would, would be, um, but from an industry perspective, um, I've kind of taken on the challenge of how we write our job descriptions. Um, and so I've noticed that our, our job descriptions for STEM jobs are um, very analytical because we're very analytical people, mm -hmm. right? But people want jobs to where they know that they are um, serving a purpose, right? So if we change that messaging as to this, instead of this job is a highly analytical job that I'm looking for, but it tack on, this is the purpose you will be serving in this job, and this is the goal you will re reach by, um, uh, um, excelling at this goal, um, at this job, then I think that adds a little bit more personality to it. So I think you talked about the human aspect of it, and you talked about the human aspect of it. So take some of the analytical out of our messaging, although they are highly analytical jobs and will require that, but add in some personality to it. And don't be so, this I'm in my lab, I'm with my chemicals, kind of Edward Einstein messaging, but you are a real person, you have real problems, and you have real things that you're trying to solve, um, and make it um, personable. Yeah, so change the messaging in that aspect. I have one more thing. <laughs> So I know it doesn't fall within the, the federal codes, but it really bothers me that STEM teachers are not classified as STEM professionals. Oh. Because every STEM teacher is a STEM professional and I believe deserves recognition as such. And pay. So, oh, panelists, thank you so much for your passion and your expertise in STEM and all things, and keep fighting the good fight. To our audience, thank you so much for being here. You know, we in this room are creating generational change, and you've got to feel really good about that. And to Sam and Region 10 for hosting this event, this is what we've been looking for for a long time, so thank you for that. <laughs>